You're going to see okay, all kinds of Google names pop up for reasons that relate to obtaining tokens for certain other things. <laughs> Just maximizing your online identity. Mm -hmm. per, um, okay, great. Well, welcome to the value group, everybody who is maybe watching this in retrospect. Oh, sorry if this felt you're getting wrong, Elizabeth. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, let's let's pick up where we left off. Uh, Matt, did you end up hosting uh, the last meeting? I think so. Okay. Yeah, I see the items from the last meeting were the RIT OSPO, and then we've got the metrics and development below that we can jump into. And it seems like project popularity uh, spawned a, a third Hydra-like head. So we can talk through what the, the right move is there. Yeah, I, I think I might summarize that as that it's extreme risk of becoming another mega metric that we can't get our heads around. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, cool. Well, let's start with the fun stuff. Um, well, it's all fun, but RIT, what's going on there? So RIT, so Stephen Jacobs, who has been joining the value call, they're setting up an OSPO at RIT in the, the Rochester Institute of Technology. And so essentially the, the premise is, is how do you um, identify value from faculty who are involved in software development, whether producing software or contributing to software. And so in an academic sense, our traditional measures of success are around journal publications and grants. And that's really what it comes down to. Yeah, um, that's all it comes down to. And so are there ways um, within universities that at least in part that we can start identifying and recognizing the good work that people are doing around software? And so Sean always has an example um, of impact. Is it, I always wanna say, is it no? Uh, Hadley Wickham at Rice University who invented, you know, wrote ggplot2. Oh uh, yeah, Hadley. Okay. Tidy, tidyverse. Uh, he's the CTO for our studio. He didn't get tenure because he didn't have enough publications at Rice. Are you serious? Yep. Yeah. But, <laughs> wow. I yeah. think software is broken. It sounds like academia has got the, the core yeah. on that market. So there's, there's a disconnect here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool, cool, cool. That, that just blows my mind because he is prolific and made the R programming language so interesting to so many people and does so much mentorship online that's very visible. All the things you have to do by hand in Python, he's just got a tidy little library that makes it easy. It's, yeah, let alone the yeah. actual interface to what you do is really pretty. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool. Okay, well, that is very interesting. That is a, um, so what, what are you imagining we could maybe do to help? Well, I think the, <laughs> at least the help in, in the, that side of the story is how would, uh, a, in a university setting, like how would we go about even proposing to measure the success of a piece of software that comes from academe? And it may be the same things that we would look at, like to measure the success of a piece of software coming from industry. Um, so what are the things that would be on that, kind of on that docket? Of... I wonder if there's something analogous here to how, um, you know, I, my mind was blown a little bit by the Red Hat acquisition, you know, full disclosure, I worked there, but um, it was the first multi-billion dollar acquisition with zero uh, proprietary technology and zero um, uh, patents for the software that, that it had. Everything was open, yet it was still evaluated for, you know, tens of billions of dollars. And I, I, it's not fresh enough in my mind to remember why, but there was some really good analysis on basically different framings because, you know, in, in my industry space, it's always been like, if you get your patent, get your name on a patent, you win like that. That is how you progress as an engineer. But now it's really shifted towards like, yeah, patents are cool, but, um, how are you contributing to open source software? Yeah. Uh, like if you're active in open source, it's almost seen as, you know, both are important and strategic in many places and respected almost, 
I don't know if I can say equally, I don't have the, the, the grounds to do so, but I'm talking to some distinguished engineers at IBM and they're very active in open source in, in a way that they wouldn't have been even five years ago, let alone 10. So I don't know, maybe there's something there. There might be something there. So I, I think what you're saying is that it's at some point in the acquisition process, there was a valuation. Yeah. Yeah. A process of valuation that was done on open source. Um, and so how, in this case, how IBM captured that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would be interesting. Yeah. It, it, even just looking at what, what was publicly disclosed and acknowledged, right? Like I, I don't have any more info than any of you, but I, I, I do recall seeing some good analysis from industry analysts like Red Monk, um, that looked into like, why is this valuable? Like, how are they, how are they redefining value, uh, in order to make this make sense? Um, Do you have any of those references? Let me, know? let me poke around. Friends? I probably bookmarked a bunch. Okay. I'll do that. Hey, Georg. Hey there. Good to see y'all. Sorry for Good being late. Oh no, you're more than welcome. I'll poke Is around that, my, that while we keep talking. Yeah, that might be a great place to start. Um, and I think the other, the other thing with, with OSPOs too, is how do you identify, and Georg, you can speak in here too, because I think you've been, we're talking about OSPOs in the academic setting, which mm -hmm. I think you've been participating in as well. So the first thing that we talked about was the determination of value of a project that was once kind of internal to the, to the university that is now having an impact on the world. How do we how do we make that valuation? And Matt had some suggestions um, with respect to the acquisition um, that IBM was involved in with Red Hat. So how, they obviously made some valuation somewhere on a piece of open source software, and there might be something in that in that story. Um, I also think that OSPOs at the university are um, about I. I don't know about identifying projects internally. So I, I think there can be a way to kind of shepherd projects internally, that it's not just about larger impact, but it's about identifying those projects that would receive further funding internally, projects that may result in um, uh, like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, new initiatives at the university, something along those lines. So how do you even begin to identify those types of projects? So Gary, do you have other thoughts on the OSPO within the, like what are the metrics that we might want to draw forward in this context? The first metric that comes to mind is the V index that we already have. Um, basically modeling the citation count kind of thing. At least the dependency count don't, haven't you worked with some of the universities in terms of kind of what they're trying to track open source wise? The universities are at a much earlier stage of how do we even make the case that we need an OSPO and gotcha. establish that. They're not yet at a point where they need to report out and meet those metrics yet. Okay. Um, one thing that comes to mind is stories and having stories as the metrics um, or as the... That the makes me so happy. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's so annoying. You're like, well, what's the best like you know qu quantitative analysis we can provide uh, by adding up the qualitative, please? <laughs> like, and yeah. it's it's so yeah. true though. That's yeah. what ends up moving us. At least for now, while the mod the projects are all so different that we don't have a um, we don't have a uniform measurement stick that we can apply no matter what metric we come up with, whatever we want to measure. Um, you know, the other, the other thing that listening to this conversation that kind of came to mind in this space 
is we've done work with um, say the Open Technology Fund or the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative um, with funding agencies who one are looking to fund projects in need of critical projects in need of support. So how do you identify what those projects are? Um, and then also to, to understand, so a lot of granting agencies, and this is still in the academic space, granting agencies will have a portfolio of <clears throat> projects that they fund. And so understanding the health of the projects that they're funding, you know, so if everybody mm -hmm. in, in the room or at least on this call is funded by the same organization to develop an open source project, how does that organization itself <clears throat> get a good understanding of how well Georg is doing, how well Elizabeth is doing, how well Sean is doing. And metrics can provide not the the full story, but at least help build part of that story. So this is not just us both within the university, but also the funding agencies that kind of interact in that space as well. One, so funding agencies brings to mind Justin Flores' work because he is at the UNICEF yeah. venture capital arm and they are funding companies that have open source technology as a core part of their work. And they are currently, I think he's talked about this. So I, I feel comfortable sharing this. He, yeah, he talked at the chaos con about this where they have a set of nine metrics, which are our evolution metrics and license risk metrics. And they just have uh, thresholds where they say these projects need to hit these points. Um, and that's their, the health marker. Oh. And then they map it out on a, on a X, Y axis along with their business metrics. Yeah. Do you have, do, Sean, I know you've done some stuff. Georg, do you, yeah, have, have, do you have the list of those metrics? They've yeah, shared a spreadsheet with us, but um, I don't think I have a list of the metrics they're using. My discussion with Justin made me believe that it was a very simple sort of scoring system where there wasn't a lot of context or nuance baked into it. Correct. But all systems are imperfect. Yeah. At least they have one to work with. Yeah, the, the effort is certainly there. Yeah. And mm -hmm. as we were talking with them, Sean, you and I, they are looking at automating this process that they have been having for a while. And we yeah. are still in that conversation. So maybe listening to this conversation as an action item, and I would, I would actually happily take this on, is to um, think about kind of framing this space a little bit that would include um, the, the emerging university OSPOs. It would include funding agencies. Like just how can we think about measuring the health? I'll just stick with that measuring the health of the communities that are of interest to us. And different people might have different angles as to why they have an interest, right? Universities might have an interest because they wanna give people tenure and promotion, right? So that's, they just wanna do that. Funding agencies might have an interest so that they know that their dollars are being placed in good spots mm -hmm. for, for projects. Um, and then funding agencies would probably also have an interest just um, to continue to better understand and shepherd the projects that they have funded over year one, year two, and year three. So it's you know, kind of the identify, identification of those projects, kind of step one, and then helping shepherd those projects as they are funded. So I heard you say the health of the projects, but um, is that, I, I'm definitely still having the bias towards the value of it. And like, just, is the, yes. Yeah, totally. Um, just want to make sure, like, is that still the, the right lens? 
like maybe health is one of the default values that some people choose. But I'm thinking towards like this boss index thing that the a VC firm came up with in Silicon Valley, Valley, which very much it's looking at the health basically by the size of a community because they just want to know like, is this a, a large addressable market that we can saturate? Um, less about like, are people happy there? Like they're, they're not getting to that granularity. It's more like, is this worth the money? Um, yeah. yeah. And I don't know, like, is that kind of the vibe you get in academia as well? Like that there's some, you know, meta metric that comes together that is value in, in someone's mind. That's either like, this is worth tenure. This is not. Yeah. It's, it's a little capricious, honestly, but money matters. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I do think it's a commonality that, here. No. Yeah. Im impact is talk. The word impact is used a lot oh, in academe. Yep. So is your work having an impact to Sean's point? Maybe not an impact in the applied world, at least, but an impact in, um, in the academic space, basically meaning are people citing your work? Exactly. That's usually the, the measure of impact. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's that just that simple, which is a, a gamed metric all by itself. Totally. So, and I'm just um, thinking like Hadley has a book from O'Reilly and it's keynoted like seven conferences that I, that, those are just the ones I've saw in the last two years. So I'm yeah. like, this is. Well, and his, I mean, I've known him going back like more than 10 years. I mean, he's been, this, this rice thing happened a long time ago and he's been doing this for a long time like yeah seven keynotes that's like kind of typical is it typical for a professor to no okay cool because that's oh. not my understanding typical for Hadley. yeah so perhaps from kind of the i'll just mm -hmm. say like the academic ospo or the university ospo it's about measuring impact okay um and then probably from a funders perspective, like that first scenario I was talking about, I don't know what the right word would be here, but it's, it's often about trying to identify projects that are critical to, um, to open source, whatever that might mean, but critical to a, a particular area, um, but are understaffed, underfunded, they might break and kill things you know what I mean? Like they might mm -hmm. actually take take down an ecosystem with them. So what yeah. are those critical pieces of digital infrastructure that we need to support? So it's it's not about identifying, I guess it's impact in the sense of there's a thousand other projects relying on this one project, right? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's also saying there are a thousand people relying on this project um, and it's completely understaffed. So like the elephant factor is one. Okay. See you, Gary. Hey, sorry. That's okay. So does that, it's like an impact plus understaffed. I would say universities mm -hmm. don't care if things are understaffed. <laughs> it's just not their operations. <laughs> it's not their problem, <laughs> but funders yeah, they're do. Working, they're working very hard to optimize the understaffing at this point. <laughs> yeah, that's a feature. Uh, I think I think the from a from a funder's perspective, it is it is a little bit more than these critical projects that we that we have to fund because they don't have the things we need. Uh, I think. I think the to a larger extent, it's the the projects that they uh, that they want to fund for some reason because they are uh, possibly uh, pushing agenda or just have interest in that area. So it's it's not always the critical funding based on risk. No, I, I think that's a good point. I mean, there different agencies will certainly focus on different. Um, corners of the the technology landscape, but don't yeah. you think the the question is still kind of the same? So, like, if you're looking at at projects that support, um, say, open source in the global south, that you're still 
you're trying to identify projects that are critically important um, in um, in that context, mm -hmm. but are, are still under understaffed or could use additional resources to really accelerate the development of, of open source in the global south. I think when you when you look at it the one way, it's kind of the, the core infrastructure initiative way where where you're these are critical projects, we have to fund them. Uh, like open SSL. However, yeah. However, uh, from a like an investment standpoint, there you also have, you know, when, when people decide if they're going to invest money in a in a stock or a company, they they look at that company's prospectus and they decide to invest in it because rather than risk, there's 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 not risk, right? There's this project looks really good, we should invest in it. Uh, so there, I think it, it, different people can come at it from different, uh, different directions. Yeah. And I, I think with funding organizations, and I, I don't have data to back this up, but my guess is that it's, it's often less about funding projects that are risky or that, that have risk associated with them and more about funding projects that actually can show that they have uh, those those things to overcome risk, right? There, there are these these mm -hmm. positive metrics that we can measure that show we're on the right track, give us money. Uh, so, well, that's fair. Just my two cents there. Yeah, I like that. Um, I was playing around with the like the cognitive framing of the word impact, right? Like, what what are some other analogous or, or like using the same sort of mental definition of impact. Um, one that I like was a big part of getting a promotion at Intel was uh, the engineers would talk of their increased impact radius, this idea of like, um, it, and this is like in the official documentation of like how to become a distinguished engineer eventually. And it's like your order of magnitude of impact has to go up um, you know, one fold each, each time you get a promotion. So yeah, yeah like, I, and yeah, go for it. Yeah, when, I was, when I was a software engineer in a medical device company in Minneapolis, the way I got promoted to principal was by demonstrating impact outside my company. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's like your, your, um, the way they talked about it, uh, was like, yeah, you, did you impact your team's effects? Did you impact your org overall uh, effect? Eventually, are you impacting like a huge number of customers with your decisions? Uh, yeah. And yeah, that that is a, I see you added the, how is that measured? <laughs> Which is apropos yeah. for our community. <laughs> and uh, I think it's gonna be just as dissatisfying as most uh, statements about this is like, did somebody in charge say you did it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and just yeah. tell a good story. <laughs> yeah, no, making you know, a manager helped me recognize I had to point out the things I was doing to get credit for them. Yeah, it's yeah, you're not given credit for the work, you're given credit for telling people about what you did. Yeah, um, which is a damn shame. So, good question. Let's yeah, let's think about it with some fresh eyes. Like, is that measurable? I love the phrase impact radius. Actually, it's a really satisfying phrase. Yeah. Yeah. The visual is good. Yeah. Yeah. Measurement is highly contextual, isn't it? I sure hope so. Yeah. What What are you thinking about? So I'm thinking like if you at the way you have described that Intel example, it's like highly specific to that circle where they are doing it. And the way they are measuring, I'm not sure. But similarly, if we look at from the open source perspective, every project looks the impact from a different angle. So that's where I'm saying it's highly contextual. Mm. I, I wonder if there is a through line, though, because there's something to be said that, you know, regardless of what, what team you're in as a senior engineer, if you want to get promoted to principal, the question was, how many customers give a crap about what you've done? Like how many millions of dollars are connected to those customers? Uh, and how many millions can we project are gonna be re uh, generated in the next five years because of them giving a crap? 
And if you can't make that measurement, if you can't attach it to a revenue stream uh, and a projected, you know, recurring revenue stream, you're still, you know, quote unquote, just being a senior engineer. You're not thinking about the company perspective of bringing it all the way through to revenue, um, which kind of gets back to the hierarchy of like, what is the point of a business? Like we want it to be about the people, but ultimately the only thing that is certain is that they need to make revenue. Yeah. yeah. Uh, are you on the uh, being in, it's a career choice too is being aware in a business if your work is on the top line or the bottom line um so even in this context the impact is in terms of revenue or in, impact is in terms of having more reputation impact is in terms of having more customer base or impact in terms of affecting the suppliers that's where i was thinking of like it's highly contextualized place where you want to measure the impact. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think we're in violent agreement from different angles that like the, the, the thing we're going to measure will be general, but like the way in which you measure it will be painfully specific. Um, and the story you tell around that measurement will be very, yeah, tough to, the only thing that will bring it through as an analogy is like, how the like can you compare the numbers <laughs> but do you think that's a is that a feature or a bug of that you know is is that just kind of a fact um what do you mean a feature or a bug here i had a like, comment but yeah yeah the idea of if we can be specific about what you're measuring and be unspecific about how you measure it uh, i guess that's a bug never mind <laughs> answered your own question. damn it okay keep going what are you thinking <laughs> well so sadly on the academic side um, so if sean produced a piece of software right and he's trying to put it forward as an artifact in his tenure and promotion case yeah um reviewing that there are a couple of ways that I could look at this. And one is that he actually does generate revenue off of it for the university. Right. And so there are what are called technology transfer offices that every research university has. Sean would essentially take his piece of software, place it into a technology transfer office, and it would be commercialized <laughs> and revenue would be generated off of it. Um, so then we're back down. And Sean, you can correct me if yeah. What I'm saying is is oh, right or wrong, yeah. but, but yeah. this is one one way I could measure Sean's impact on a piece of software, and yeah. I would care about that as a as a member of a tenure and promotion process. Or I would say, look at this is actually generating revenue for the college, the the university, the college, and the unit or department. Um, yeah. There there are other things that I could take a look at, which is. For example, if Sean had a piece of software and he developed an open source community around it, and there were there were X number of contributors to that, right? It's not revenue driven at all. It's about the size of the community that he builds around it. Um, that will matter less. I'm just going to be <laughs> like brutally honest here. And so in an, uh, it's what we're here promotion. to do. <laughs> <laughs> And Sean, you can again tell me that you disagree with me. But no, I think you're. I mean, you're 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 basically right that that those are cases I could make. The interestingly for me, the, the strongest I used Augur to analyze yeah. the master's in data science program that I created, which we created the curriculum entirely in GitHub, and demonstrated that I wrote myself forty eight percent of the curriculum and supervised 45% of the rest of it that was developed by TAs. And so there were a few other small contributors. So I was able to like put that in my dossier and say, flat out quantitatively, no matter what anybody else says in this political game, because it's worth a lot of money now, I did this. Yes, but the, <laughs> and, and in that case, the data science program generates revenue. Right, oh, so, um, so, so yeah. if I can show that you built a program you're a 50% contributor to a program that generates millions of dollars in revenue. <laughs> Again, rock solid. I mean, <laughs> that's an easy case for me to make yeah. in, in, an, in a tenure and promotion. 
case. I, I can just hold those two things up to the light and, and see the value that you generate. If you were showing that you um, did 50% of the work on an open source project that was being used, but generating no revenue, it's just the case is just not as solid. You'd be a lot of the startups that I participate <laughs> around and, and yeah, you'd have great adoption and be bankrupt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think in your case, Sean, you, you had great you adoption. Great adoption. You'd bankrupt. Yes. <laughs> but in your data science case, you had great adoption and you were not bankrupt. Exactly. Like, it was, and so regrettably in the university setting, I do think it comes down to revenue quite a bit. So I don't think we can pretend that it doesn't. In that way, I think it's the great equalizer. It is maybe, um, you know, morally disappointing when we see how the sausage is made, but it is kind of enlightening to admit because it, it equalizes the nonprofit space along with the profit space. Um, yeah, and it makes me realize that any of the things that people may be doing in the for-profit space may actually be fully applicable. <laughs> yeah. In, in the, in the, we don't have to reinvent the way the, the methods by which we get the same data might change, but we still ultimately want the same data. You know, like the, the path to measure revenue in Sean's case is a little bit different than the path to measure revenue. Absolutely. Yeah. A, yeah. 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 Um, and then the only other thing that could come from it is if Sean produced a piece of software um, that had a, a large contributor base, great, like the bankrupt issue. But if he was yeah. able to generate a lot of papers off of it, mm. then I actually, I still don't care about the software. <laughs> I only care yeah, about the papers. No, like, <laughs> really? Yeah, like, yeah. I, I, had a, I had some software. I, I had two pieces. I have three or four pieces of software that have been big parts of my academic career and in each case that the papers that resulted from them yeah. that have that mattered and i will only yeah, i will only look at the papers and, huh. yeah well now you're learning about academe <laughs> like, that's <laughs> that's why i'm here i'm the i think yeah. well actually uh, with elizabeth i'm not no longer the lone uh <laughs> industry <laughs> pundit <laughs> And then group. the and then the third thing that can actually be tied to a piece of software and a little like papers, I don't particularly care about the software from a review perspective is the ability to generate grants. Yeah, and that's there's a like if I can start making connections between say software work that Sean is doing and grants from NIH or NSF, but again, I'm going to drop the software and only look at the grant. My dean, my dean sends out a monthly report. It doesn't include publications or citations or scholarly impact. It, it includes ex grant dollar expenditures. It's our monometric. So this has actually been super interesting to me, <laughs> even just talking I, through this. <laughs> yeah, this is fascinating. Good. Um, I, so, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. No, you first. I was just going to ask if there's ever a case where the software is providing value that isn't either money or individual value for the person who's trying to move their career forward. Like, is there ever a case? I mean, I guess maybe in an, in an indirect way, the Augur project did help the university create this, or you, you know, Sean at the university create this new thing. Yeah. But ultimately that was about money. Is there ever a case where it would just be an intrinsic value? Like it just would help the university uh, run better or my, my My opinion is that the most impactful piece of academic or scholarly or yeah, academic software in the last 15 years is Zotero. Um, every single person who writes papers has to manage citations and the file and where they got them and it's a hard problem and the zotero project is an open free you can buy storage project that works better than any of its predecessors um and it, for me personally it's had a, a huge impact on my production academically in terms of producing papers but will that be considered in the tenure track 
Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, it matters more that I write papers and they get cited because I'm on the tenure track for sure. But I think I think even getting a PhD, it I would say if I'd have had that when I was getting a PhD, it would have taken me 15, 20 percent less time to finish that PhD. Because yeah. citation management is a really like 15 years ago, it was a really gnarly problem. Yeah, no, thank you. So yeah. Elizabeth, to your question too, I think there is the potential for software work to have um, impact within a community. So um, I would even say like the work, if I'm thinking about the work that you have done in the past, say around PHP women, like when you started that program, um, I don't know if there was software associated with it per se, but, um, but like it, to, to do that and have an impact on the lives of people would, would be a positive. So it's not generating revenue. I don't know if PHP women generated revenue. It's not generating re revenue, um, but it's certainly having a positive impact on, on the lives of people. Um, so I think the answer can be yes to this. And that's a good point as well. So within the, within, I guess within the university setting, that value could exist where it makes students' lives better or administrators' lives better, or, or like to Sean's point, the, the professors' lives better. Yeah, or um, the Omaha community better or... Okay. And I'd argue it's the, the, one of the purposes of the academy is the generation of scholarly output. So um, it makes, it, it helps the whole institution fulfill its mission more efficiently the one of the i think that's a good point i think that's a, a metric certainly worth tracking um no. from hold, let me hold on a second so but from a from a from a tenure and review process m many of those things that like again if i'll just talk about php women um, it's going to show up in typically in service so it's going to yeah. show up as a service category it's going to be devalued which is, Yep, which is it, it immediately. So research is at research institutions. It's research, and then teaching <laughs> service. So, yeah. Um, but but it's certainly something that that it could be recognized in the classroom um, and in a community. So that's a fair point. Okay, I was just curious. That's what I was also pointing. Service learning, which we observe in the different classes, the instructor asks the students to perform, is like tying back to the community. So, from listening to the conversation earlier about revenue tied to a project, I just thought, hey, let's uh, start a new metric. <laughs> So if you look at the link that I added to the minutes and in the chat. Hey, let's start a new metric and make it sound like, hey, let's start a band. <laughs> <laughs> well, take a look at it. Um, I like what uh, Matt Broberg was saying about um, revenue you, tied to a project. A so what, Sean? Are you sharing a screen? No, I shared a link in the chat. Okay, got it. And in the minutes. Yep, in there. Yep. So we, we discussed three different ways of looking at revenue that is tied to project. One was other customers we have that care about the project then one is we can generate revenue directly by using the project in our providing the service or product. This is to, um, to Elizabeth's example of finding time savings, whatever, by using the technology. And then the third one is fu funds and grants that we got for the project or related to it. Yeah. Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah, this is great. Yeah. When did you write this while we were talking? Yeah, I was just listening to you last 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
Georg, I'm sorry, is this um, specific to academia or just in general? Just a general, okay. I took it as in general, yeah. Yeah, I think that was my takeaway from the conversation too, that it, it may even apply very nicely across. And it, it could be, I mean, the metric, I think this is great. Thank you, Georg. I mean, the metric could make a statement, right? That these are the things that we want to capture. I think I had mentioned it earlier that the way that a company would capture this kind of stuff is probably logistically a little bit different than the way a university would capture it. Yeah. And I might, I might say that this, that there should be a, so revenue corresponds with an income statement, um, costs and, and income. Uh, revenue is one part of that. Uh, we might look at costs tied to a project. Oh. That's that's the other side of the income statement. But then I think value tied to a project, like financial value tied to a project. That's 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 what venture capital is thinking about. That's what that. So there's this balance sheet view of software that I think is where a lot of the insane company valuations from Silicon Valley emerge from. They're not related to revenue or costs at all. They're yeah. related to somebody's anticipated value of this thing at some point in the future. And that those are three distinct parts of the balance. The balance sheet and the income statement are two key ways that projects are looked at financially. Yep. I agree with Sean, point well taken. What would you think about separating those out into different metrics? I think that's that we have one that is focused on generating revenue and yeah. one that is focused on creating value by reducing the cost. I can tell you the latter is not going to be nearly as popular. Like you're, you. This is a really important thread. Like the revenue side is is where value yeah, I, is perceived. I would say costs to recreate could be a very powerful, so, so um, sunk costs yeah. tied to a project but, or estimated sunk costs tied to a project, which I, I can get that in Augur. Um, oh, fun. Uh, using Kokomo. And uh, you just have to provide an average uh, hourly labor rate for a developer on each piece of the project. So there's some inputs and it's obviously not science, but it is an estimating. It's a sort of a, it's better than guessing. Yeah, where we're going, we don't need science. Yeah, <laughs> we just need good stories. Yeah, um, yeah, very yeah. cool. Right. Well, so maybe we'll pick it up from there, whether that ties nicely into the revenue, uh, it's a project target here or whether like this is a, a slightly different metric space yeah and i i do need to take off because yeah. i'm on a podcast right after this and good I deal need a, need a short break that sounds good for all of us we'll we'll Very pick this up Sorry. yeah we'll have one more meeting before the end of the year if all goes as planned see you then bye see, yep see you Thank then you thanks matt bye. thanks everybody bye all.